So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rima Ajluni, who will be presenting her paper, Aperiodic Geometry, A New Class of Symmetry in Ancient Architecture. Dr. Ajluni is currently an assistant professor at, at the College of Architecture, and she has completed her BS and her MS in Architectural Engineering. She obtained her PhD in Architecture from Texas A&M University in 2005. Her research in investigates the use of computation and pattern recognition in architecture and heritage preservation. Dr. Arjuluni has achieved an unusually strong record of publications, invited lectures, and leadership in international settings. Her papers are published by some of the highest scientific and technical journals outside of her field, which is unusual in architecture. Um, she is the author of Digital Pattern Recognition in Heritage Rec Recording 2009, and her unique experience and knowledge of Islamic patterns has enabled her to play a major role in resolving the mathematical mystery of quasi-crystals. <coughs> Her latest discovery is published in Acta Crystallographa, Section A, Foundation for Crystallography, <laughs> 2012. She has been recognized as major, this research has been recognized as a major contribution to the understanding of quasi-crystalline formations. Uh, and in 2012, she received the Architectural Research Center Consortium New Researcher Award for her multidisciplinary breakthrough. Uh, Dr. Ajluni spent a year in Iraq establishing a workshop there to assist with the uh, conservation of the Erbil Citadel, which is where we met um, Peter Eusta, who's here with us today from Prague. And then, of course, he was, uh, played an integral role in our uh, Prague study abroad last summer, uh, giving generously of his time. And so um, with that, this is how this all works together. <laughs> I'm always telling students, students, it's all about networks. So, uh, Dr. Ishlini. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and um, thank you to be here for you to be here today. Um, today, my presentation will um, give an example of how historic preservation and understanding historic structure can inform our understanding of some basic theories in modern science. The emergence of quasi-periodic um, theories, tiling theories in mathematics and material science is revealing a new type of symmetry um, which has a lot of um, specific um, quality, visual and uh, structural qualities that can be used uh, for art and architecture and revealing a new type of symmetry that can really inform much more um, and we can use it in, in, in design. Um, contemporary mathematical theory, um, supported by computer power, have recently emerged as a new paradigm for de design, innovation, and creativity. And um, within this paradigm, um, design is being engaged in a, a multidisciplinary sphere that's actually oscillating between different disciplines. And um, in this multidisciplinary sphere, um, design um, is being informed by different sciences and um, contemporary mathematical theories inclu including complex hierarchies, fracture, subsimilarity, inflation, deflation, sphere packing are all being um, used or embraced as um, a source for stimulus for articulating new forms, patterns, surfaces, and structures. And just to give you an example of some of these um, application architecture recently, whether um, and how it's been used. This is the Federation Square in Melbourne, where actually um, geometric patterns, fractional self-similarity have been used. And if you look at one, at this facade, the surface, the surface is actually you have uh, what we call self-similarity and fractals, where the same tiling is dissected to a smaller scale of the same tiling. Other examples is the Louvre in Abu Dhabi, and this is under, still under design, where you see the principle of self-similarity is used here and demonstrated how you start with a basic pattern and then dividing it based on certain rules to a smaller size of the same pattern, doing that, and you can come up with a very complicated structure, but this is, can be used for structure optimization and, um, and, and very interesting um, surface qualities. 
Another example is the water cube in Beijing, where they use this fear packing as a, pr a principle for structural optimization. And this is, again, links bi to biology and foam uh, packing. So we're going back to really understanding what's how science and nature is forming um, and try to use these principles in design. <laughs> Uh, another example using fractal and substitution or inflation deflation rules where again a set of ties or a set of um, geometric elements can be dissected down to a smaller size of the same pattern. It can give very interesting visual and, and structural properties. And, and this is basically the spider extension of Victoria Albert Museum in London. And we can see um, kind of the tiling system that's been used. Uh, other example demonstrate the use of periodic patterns or aperiodic patterns, which is uh, the theme of this presentation. And this is the story hall in Melbourne, where they actually use a Penrose uh, pattern. This is a, um, a famous Penrose uh, tiling system that was discovered in the 70s. And you see it, it, it's a quasi-periodic tiling system that we can talk about today. Now, these are two examples of quasi-crystalline tiling, uh, or what we say, aperiodic tiling, or quasi-crystal tiling, so, um, or quasi-aperiodic tiling, you can uh, hear different ones. Now, quasi-crystalline tiling specifically is related to a new material that was discovered in um, 1982. And these are, uh, these are two examples of, uh, well, this is Penrose tiling, a five-fold quasi-periodic tiling, and this is a man tiling. It's uh, um, octagonal, eight-fold tiling. And both of these, if you look at them, they have a system, they have some local system, but it's really hard to understand how the global system works. And you look, it's really, it's repeating, but it's kind of chaos, but it's, it's not clear what exactly, how is the, the order in this. And to give you a little bit background about this discovery, we go back in the morning of April um, 8th, 1982, a scientist by the name Danny Schutman was um, sitting in uh, the U.S. National Institute of Standard and Technology and he was working with um, melting aluminum and manganese and then rapidly cooling them, expecting to see random patterns within the atoms because it's um, when you cool them um, basically rapidly. Now to his surprise, he found this pattern. This is what we call diffraction pattern. And this diffraction pattern, actually, it's think about it, if you um, kind of uh, direct a laser or light at the crystals, it will deflect based on the structure. And this is a technique used in crystallography to show the crystal structure. And he saw this pattern. And if it looked deeper, he started counting the, 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 the dots, and it's actually based on 10 points. Ten uh, fold, and according to crystallography or traditional crystallography, tenfold is cannot exist within, um, you know, with the crystallography. It's it's what we call the forbidden symmetry, or they used to call it the forbidden symmetry, because um, atoms within crystals had to, or originally was thought that had to, or have its order within an aperiodic system that actually uh, repeat periodically, not aperiodically. And um, so basically when he discovered that he thought he made a mistake, he went back um, and did the experiment again and again. And actually, I, he, um, I get the chance to see this guy in, in September and really get the, the story from him directly. And um, so basically after many, um, you know, um, revision and actually consulting with other sciences, they realized that this is a new material that they've been, never been explored before. And of course it took him actually two years to publish his first paper. It took him 10 years to change the definition of crystallography and um, almost 28 years to win the Nobel Prize, which he did in 2011. And um, it's really a very intriguing journey for him and it's, it's interesting just to hear from him exactly uh, the, the kind of resistance from the scientific community and how actually now they're realizing this is completely new a matter that never existed. And this uh, quasi crystals, so, so far they've been discovered hundreds of them and these are metallic compounds and uh, they have very special properties that really, um, you know, um, they can be used in many applications in science engineering. Now, to understand exactly what that means, the structure of the atom, if we look inside the traditional crystal, um, atoms has to repeat in a periodic pattern. 
Um, and if we look, let's say, a threefold, this is a threefold, a threefold symmetry. And if we have one atom surrounded by three atoms, and if we rotate the same um, unit or geometry uh, 120 degrees uh, around this axis, you'll see that the distances between the atoms still consistent. It's in the same. The same thing with four. Fold. If you rotate it 90 degrees, you'll come up, the, the distance between the atoms is still the same. Um, also, sixfold, if you rotate it um, 60 degrees, you'll see that it's exactly the distances are the same. Now, if you do fivefold and rotate it, you'll find that's a problematic issue where the atoms in this corner are actually closer than that. So, so that's what, how scientists use to prove that fivefold cannot exist or cannot really part of uh, existing crystals or crystallography. Another thing, if you shift the same, looking at the different symmetries, if you shift the same unit, let's say about the threefold, uh, shift it, it will um, click exactly in place and will form a kind of a tight construction. The same thing with fourfold. Um, also, sixfold. Now, if you start shifting the pentagon around, you'll see you get, you get these gaps, and that cannot exist. These gaps cannot exist really in, in real crystals. So, um, scientists start kind of uh, understanding mathematician how would this work? How would this aperiodic system work with keeping the distances between the atoms the same and without having these gaps? Um, just looking at this material under the microscope, it's really very beautiful material. Now, of course, after 10 years, the electronic microscopes start to be clearer and much sharper, and we can see these um, very, very interesting multi-dimensional uh, patterns. And um, if you really look at deeply, a little bit closer, you'll see there are some repeating units within the structure. And look again, you'll see kind of, this is a five-fold symmetry. And you see that there are these repeating units, however, it's still it's not clear how they're arranged. And they look as if they're random, but however, I mean, because the crystal cannot be random, um, the only random thing in, in crystal is the glass. So uh, this is it's weird. So since this discovery, um, the atoms in these complicated structures are not arranged according to regularly spaced intervals, similar to traditional crystals. Instead, they exhibited a complicated long-range translational order. Uh, that is not periodic. And translational order means that shifting the same unit um, into dimension and um, if we have a copies of the same unit to, to, to do the structures. Now, scientists start looking for, um, for inspiration and, and how to resolve these um, systems. And one of the earliest um, kind of answers came from mathematical games and mosaics, such as puzzles. Uh, constructed by mathematicians, and they um, went to, in, in, to, in 1970, um, a scientist, a mathematician, <coughs> scientist um, called Roger Penrose, he's created these um, mosaic ties, uh, five-fold mosaic ties, and it used to be it's a puzzle that you actually play with it, and um, scientists, well, mathematicians were fascinated with the idea of tiling the space, or the, 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 well, the, the space with minimum number of ties, with, um, and basically trying to see how, um, make it not to repeat the same pattern again. It's, it's, it was part of, kind of a puzzle. And he created these two sets of ties, and this is one of them. Um, these ties, um, they're based on the golden proportion, and um, they have, these are basically one of, of, of the two sets that say, he kind of created. This is a fat and thin rhombus. And based on certain matching rule, if you start matching these styles together, you start getting, building a system of um, aperiodic uh, nature, where actually there are certain rules. You have really to stick to those rules, the matching rules. And then you can start building really a system that although the units are repeating, but um, it grows not based on a, a periodic system. It's completely quasi-periodic or aperiodic. Also, if you look deep at these uh, quality of these um, tiles, they have what they call inflation-deflation rules, where you actually dissect each of these if, if, if units to, if, through a certain system, and by dissecting them, you can get a smaller scale of the same system. And if we start, let's say, with a discrete batch of um, these tiles and dissecting it based on that system, you get a smaller scale of these tiles, and that's based of, uh, of the golden rule, and also, if you dissect the new patch, you get an, an, a smaller scale. And if you keep doing that, you get 
basically um, a, a big portion of the style, but still it's finite because you start with a finite um, kind of local rules. Another way to, um, that science has been working on for the last um, also uh, kind of um, 30 years is understanding that local qualities. And this is another way uh, that mathematicians found that they construct these patterns is based on uh, what they call, this is a man grid. It's one of, um, you know, a man, um, he, he wasn't actually a scientist. He was a postman who was um, working and, and having a lot of time on his hand and, and he discovered these and other patterns. Um, and basically, if you have a series of Fibonacci, uh, of, of grid based on Fibonacci series, and if you rotate them and um, copy them and rotate them in, 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 uh, in five orientation in this case, and based on certain rules, you can actually construct these patterns too. Another way, which is um, also, this is very interesting, that you can actually also construct these patterns or the Penrose patterns using projection from a higher dimension to a lower dimension. This is a very complicated thing to, to kind of understand. And actually a mathematician, um, a mathematician told me that you're not supposed to even visualize it because it doesn't work. And actually Penrose patterns are, um, are um, kind of conceived as um, two-dimensional project projection of five-dimensional hypercubic structures. So, but to understand the principle, uh, we can do projection from 2D to 1D. And so if we have a grid of two-dimensional periodic system, and if we cut it through a slice of a rational, um, basically a rational slice, which means that the, 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 that the angle is actually based on the golden proportion. And, um, and if this slice actually trap within it, and, and the thickness of the sli slice is actually one unit, is similar to the thickness of the grid itself. And if you see that the slice traps some of the points in the grid. And if we project those, you actually come up with the Fibonacci series. So this is just example of how projection from two dimension to one dimension give you, from, uh, give you um, an aperiodic system. And Fibonacci series is a one dimensional aperiodic system that it does not repeat. It has system, but it does not repeat. Now, so since this, all these um, investigations, scientists, uh, um, although these really um, added a lot of information about our understanding of the local order of, of these patterns, of this uh, formation, however, um, it's still missing the long range order. That if we could find where's the long range order of this, it will be easier to manufacture materials, really create more of these to really start exploring the properties and structure of these. So, and the answer came from a very unusual place. It came from ancient architecture. And um, scientists, mathematicians, artists, they noticed that there are some patterns within the ancient architecture, and these are basically ancient Islamic architecture. <coughs> and they have kind of some similar qualities. If you look deep, there is a system, but it's also, there's a lot of um, kind of a chaos in there. So, scientists and mathematicians, everyone start analyzing these and understanding them. And we found that um, there are actually tenfold quasi-periodic systems in ancient architecture. And the oldest is actually this one, which is in Iran in the 12th century. You have this one in the 15th century, in the 14th century. Um, and, and these are basically three in Iran and this one in, in Morocco. Uh, which I had, um, you know, the pleasure of that this um, summer to go and actually uh, photograph them and, and see them face to face. Another thing we discovered that there's octagonal quasi-periodic system too. That um, most of these actually um, in uh, Spain and Morocco. And if you see again, there is a system, and maybe sometimes when you look at it, you think, okay, this is based on a fourfold, but it's not. Um, I'll, I'll show you in a second how's that. But this is a system, but it's a little bit complicated. And also recently in 2011, we found this, um, we actually, Makovsky um, found um, a 12-fold uh, quasi-periodic system. Um, and this one is Morocco, in, in, in Maulai Ibrisi, and actually I visited to uh, this, this past summer. So um, based on this investigation, that's basically my research. I went back and started investigating these patterns, especially I have um, my history in understanding these patterns. I, uh, I spent most of my, um, my professional academic career actually working on Islamic geometry. <coughs> and looking at these systems, these are also uh, basically global systems of the, some of the patterns we've seen. Again, you look, there's 
um, a lot of systems, a lot of repeating in it, but still it's very, um, um, it's very, it looks very random. So based on this understanding, and based on the understanding that all these patterns were constructed by a compass and a straight edge, so basic rules. So I went back to the basic rules. In 2011, I, um, I presented the first multi-level hierarchy framework model, the HFM model, that actually explain uh, the global system. And basically that by using a compass and straight edge, ancient designers were able to resolve these complicated geometry where modern mathematicians and scientists have been working on with all these complicated mathematics and, 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 and computer power um, really did not. And that's really offend a lot of the mathematician when I say that. <laughs> Um, now, to understand the system, um, this is just talk a little bit about the Islamic construction of Islamic pattern. Um, it is a parametric system, as, as we talk about it today, um, that it's based on two units. It's based on what you call a basic grid, and a basic grid is a basic grid of polygons. You can have any uh, basic grid of polygons or a combination of different polygons combining the basic grid, and what I call the seed unit or a, un or a peat unit. And um, the way it works is that if you plant the seed unit within the basic grid, you get a, a, some kind of formation. And you then just by extending the is actually by extending the line of the seed unit, you come up with a grid, um, a pattern. Now, of course, the basic grid is actually um, not shown in the final construction. So this is kind of a hidden system that organizes the geometry. And also, there are different ways to connect these units. So this is up to the artist's choice. So they can take different formations. You see, these are the different kind of basic grid and, 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 and units. But then the formation are extended, connected differently. Now, if we do the same basic grid but change the design of the seed unit, we'll come up with a complete different formation. So by using this system, they were able to produce you know, hundreds and thousands of these patterns, really kind of by a combination. Now, this means that really the uh, symmetry is controlled by the hidden basic grid, not by the seed unit. And the seed unit is controlled the design of the system. So starting with that, I started analyzing these uh, period patterns. Let's start with this example. This is um, actually from Darbul Imam Shrine in Asfahan, Iran. And um, if we start to analyze this, and let's just focus now on the central piece, which is the first hierarchy of the pattern. And um, if you start analyzing this, the first thing you see, this is basically a decagon. And, um, and if you see these kind of light line in the original, they actually, if you connect the side of the decagon in a certain way, you come up with this grid, or this kind of um, uh, octagram, uh, decagram. Now this will define a new size of um, the decagram, of uh, decagon. If you do the same process again, I don't know if you guys can see it, um, you come up with a smaller one. You connect it again, you come up with a smaller one, smaller one, and you really can control this the way you want and stop at one point. But then this actually kind of progression of nested decagrams define the seed unit or the size of the seed unit, which is relational to the whole system. Now, if you look at the intersection points, these, I don't know if you can see the dots, now, this is actually the center point of each of these seed units. So they basically fall by a simple, and this is can be easily constructed by a compass and straight edge. And basically, by just uh, controlling this proportional system, they were able to um, analyze and, and construct these patterns. Now, if we go back and, and try to um, look kind of deeper at this um, system, and this is uh, the basic grid, and it's a progression of nested um, uh, decagrams. If you try to analyze it, you see that it's actually follow Fibonacci series. And if you analyze the different radiuses, um, the ratios of different races of each radius to the one smaller to it, it's actually exactly give you the golden proportion. So they really figured out how to control that essence of the geometry. And uh, by doing that, the seed unit is exactly proportional that actually it will click exactly in its place when you put it. So um, if to give examples, let's just see how we, they constructed the whole system. So they start with the first hierarchy. And with the first hierarchy, you start with the basic grid. Now you have the seed unit, which actually you can control the geometry of it. You can get so many uh, variations of the geometry. 
Now, if you plug in the seed unit within the grid, you come up with this formation. Now, from that, you basically, you need to connect this um, unit, just extend the line of it, and um, the connecting formation can take different, uh, different forms. In this case, they actually use this um, extension or this connection, which also part of overlapping uh, of, of the same, uh, same unit. Now, if we connect it, and this is just to say um, how this overlapping um, of the same unit actually create that uh, connecting you come up with a line grid, and of course, um, in Islamic geometry, a lot of these patterns are rendered, and you come up with what you call the, this is the, the first hierarchy uh, of the system. Now, the question is, how would you grow the system? Because, okay, we know that this is kind of the central part, but then how to go from there? And it's, um, so the system is based on multi-hierarchical system that each, unit, each hierarchy is based on the second hierarchy. Now, to build the second hierarchy, we do the same thing. And we build a new um, progression, a new uh, um, kind of generation of the nested um, decagrams. Now, the seed unit is actually the previously constructed unit. So this now acts as the seed unit for the next hierarchy. So this is actually the seed unit. And by doing the exact thing, now taking the seed unit and plug it in within the framework, which based on the same, of course, proportional system, and with kind of also following the same uh, logic um, or rules with the, uh, the geometry of the connecting formation, you come up with this. And this is the second hierarchy. Now to build it to the third hierarchy, you actually take this as the seed unit for the bigger system, and this way this can be constructed infinitely, and that's basically what the characterization of a quasi-periodic system that has to be constructed infinitely. Now, so each, each unit really, each, uh, each um, level is, uh, you cannot predict what it will happen. It's, it's basically based on the system will come up with that. Now, if we do, okay, one of the things, if you look kind of closer at one axis of this um, uh, formation, you'll see that actually it's had based on two units and repeated based on Fibonacci <coughs> series too. So it's a really very um, a kind of a controlled system. Now, um, this is just to compare the, uh, the diffraction pattern that um, the scientist Danny saw with the basic grid and how it clicks exactly in all these peaks. Now, to see how it's uh, used to construct Penrose tiling, um, we'll do the same thing. We start with the basic grid, which is the exact one we did with uh, the Islamic pattern. And we have, these are the repeating units. In this case, this is the main seed unit. And everything, and all the other units actually parts of the repeating units. So these are kind of the major ones. And you basically plug it in place. And this has a little bit different rules because you have to rotate some of these tiles too. Now, to um, the connecting formation, in this case, actually parts of the seed units. And if you plug it in place, you come up with the first hierarchy. <coughs> to move forward, you build a new formation of the grid, and you plug it in. You come up, and this, this is partial, and you come up with the second hierarchy. Now, so Penrose patterns can be constructed infinitely, very easily, with any software and um, even if you want by a compass and straight edge. Now, to do the same thing with octagon-based, um, this is actually a paper I presented in, in September in uh, a periodic uh, crystal conference in Australia. Um, and um, we found these patterns, and if you look at this pattern, it looks like it's a fourfold because you have these, but actually it's not. Um, let's see how we analyze this. If we start by the same system, kind of looking on, um, kind of to reading um, the, the geometry, the background geometry of it. And if you connect that, those, um, the octagons in a certain way, it's really you can get different formation. And this way it just connected, um, it's leaving one point and connected to the other. It's give us um, a new octagon, a smaller connecting, in this case, now we're, we're leaving two, that's the choice of the artist, and have a new one, and you keep doing that, you come up with a smaller one. So this is kind of the basic grid <coughs> for this one. And this, we're just now focusing on only the central cartwheel pattern. Now, if you try to analyze this, you'll see that it's actually the, um, the proportion of these radiuses are based on root two plus one, which also one of kind of the golden ratio, golden or important irrational uh, ratios. Now, to see how we can use this to construct the pattern, 
Uh, now, also, um, the that's ratio between the seed unit and the whole framework is actually two root two plus three. Now, to see how this works, we start with the basic grid. We have the repeating unit, and again, repeating in the seed unit, repeating unit is, is simply kind of following the same <coughs> principle. You can construct it by simply connecting these lines, and these can be complex or, or can be a simple one, depending on how many a formation. And you plug it in in place, you come up with this hierarchy. Now, there's, in this case, there's a different way to do the connecting formations, just to give uh, that there's uh, many formations you can come up with this. Now, if you use any of this, this is just using one uh, connecting formation, but also we can connect using different of these connections. We can come up with different organizations if you see that uh, these are a little bit different. Now, to do um, kind of the second hierarchy, we do the same thing, where we build a new uh, generation of the, um, of, uh, of the basic grid, and now the seed unit is actually the final, the constructed cartwheel of the same, the first hierarchy. And by doing the same basic plugin in the same place, we come up with the global kind of the second hierarchy. In this case, the pattern in um, in the Alhambra, actually in Sevilla, is actually um, part of the global system. Now, um, moving on, we'll go to. Um, and then uh, tiling is basically, again, it's a periodic tiling. This is um, actually a postman who was working and, and he was uh, kind of bored and started playing with the, with the tiling system. He came up with this eight-fold tiling, a periodic system. And it follows similar to Penrose. They actually have two units, a square and kind of a rhombo. And by certain matching rules, you can come up with this um, formation. And because matching rules is very complicated, you'll, you'll, you're bound to make a mistake at one point that you cannot go beyond kind of a smaller patch. Um, now, to use the same principle we used uh, for the uh, pattern in Sevilla, um, this is just to show that this is a diffraction pattern of octagon quasicrystal, and this is the, um, the framework of nested um, ectograms that uh, we develop, I developed in, in part of Sevilla. Um, we use this system, I use this system to uh, wrote a, um, a code that actually allowed the, the, the construction of these hierarchies. And it's a very simple code, actually. But um, I, I use CC+, um, a GLOT, OpenGL and GLOT, and a compiler, it's called Bloodsheds. It's, um, um, it's a free compiler that we can use. And it allows allow me to uh, construct many of these hierarchies. But the geometry itself is based on controlling or figure out the intersection points and how to uh, basically, based on this uh, relational system, build a multi-level hierarchy. And this is controlled by um, basically the ratios between each um, radius to the smaller one is root two plus one, and also it's, it's work on both cases in both direction. And this is basically controlling the ratio of the central unit to the whole framework. And just by using, actually it's a simple equation, you can, you can figure out the exact intersection point and then really use it to generate infinite ties of these. So to do the same thing with a man, I mean, you start with the basic grid and you have the basic unit, the seed unit. And the seed unit is, again, it's easily constructed by a composite straight edge. And um, in this case, the connecting formation is actually part of the seed unit, kind of similar to, um, to Penrose. Now, if we plug it in in place, you'll see that plugging the seed unit within the framework form kind of um, octagons, as, as kind of a network of octagons in between. You plug it in, you come up with the first hierarchy. Now we use the first hierarchy as the seed unit for the second hierarchy. And, uh, basically following the same system, you come up with the second hierarchy. In this case, again, with the second system, this is the seed unit, and the connected formation actually part of that seed unit. Now, if you want to grow the system even further, you can actually um, start by uh, using this as the seed unit for the larger hierarchy, for the third hierarchy. Now, what this means, this means that we have a parametric system that really we can manipulate to design many, many new, uh, new uh, patterns. Um, um, and I'm testing one of it. This is basically a basic grid. I'm, I'm using a different design. 
Uh, this is a, a, a tenfold and a fivefold. Um, I'm using a different design for the seed unit and plug it in based on certain rules. Uh, so, so the kind of thing about the parametric system, if you change the basic grid or the design of the seed unit or the, um, the distribution of these seed units within the system, you can come up with the many, many variations of the pattern. In this case, if we plug in, in this case, this is the seed unit and the uh, connecting formation actually part of the seed unit. And if you see, this is kind of how the connecting formation attach the, the seed unit. And we plug it in, in place based on this intersection. And then by connecting, you know, putting in the seed unit, we come up with this um, basically uh, basic pattern. Now, if we analyze this so this is further, you'll see that it has what we call inflation deflation rules. That if we have one tile and dissect it down to the same tile, you can basically go do this um, many, many times. You can, have, you can come up with a, a big um, system. Now, this is what actually mathematicians need to see to prove that this system can grow infinitely. Um, and that's exactly what I did this, to prove to them that it can grow infinitely. So if you see that if you kind of do the same deflation inflation and map it to Penrose system, um, exactly, you can actually start using it to do a Penrose system. And this is actually the other Penrose tiling system that's proved that actually the same rules can, can grow the, say, the second Penrose system. Now to grow it to the second hierarchy, you do the same thing, you grow the, sec the, the, the basic grid and put it in place and, and then you come up with the second hierarchy. If you see these, these are basically just different, it represent this, uh, the kind of the inflation rule, inflation deflation rule for the second hierarchy. Now, I'll try to be <laughs> quick. Now, what's next? It's really um, trying to take it to the third dimension, especially that crystals are in the third dimension. Um, also, start working with mathematicians to um, work on sevenfold and ninefold because these are kind of, kind of the mystery um, um, composition. Um, also, I've recently uh, been to um, uh, 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 kind of a workshop with. Uh, um, organic chemist in, in Indiana that they're going to use that system to try to test the natural material, especially how viruses uh, form uh, or how it's used as part of uh, uh, nanophotonics. Um, and um, even recently, um, Rhino have approached me to do actually a plug-in to Rhino to start uh, providing these symmetries for, for designers and architects and, and even scientists. And that's it for me today. Thank you for listening. <laughs>